when even the local cryptids are nice enough to give you directions and offer you a hot cup of Tim Hortons coffee, you know you're in Canada. Which is great, because that's where today's stories take place, up in America's chilly hat. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where I'm trying to get Ireland to send me some cows, since apparently they want to cull around 200,000 of the poor things. Enjoy these allegedly true and scary stories from Canada, and be sure to send me your scary stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. You can also send me your scary work stories there if you want them narrated on Tales from the Break Room, which is my other podcast. Lastly, go to eeriecast.com for more scary shows like this and a shop at our store. Thank you. Now, let's begin. The following story provides several links to some interesting ghost hunting videos containing orbs and ghostly voices caught on camera relevant to the story. I highly recommend taking a look at these videos along with the stories as I narrate them. You can find links in the description. Haunted Mansion of Hagersville, Ontario From Frankie G I'm a paranormal investigator by hobby. I've investigated a lot of haunted locations ever since I was 16. I'm now 33. The stories I'm going to share here are from a house located in Hagersville, Ontario, Canada. I was around 22 when they happened. The house used to be an old age home, but it was for taking care of elderly people with special needs. My older sister, who's like a second mother to me, lived a mere 15 minute walk down the road from that house. My mom and my sister were pregnant at the same time, so I had a nephew the same age as me, and later another one who was five years younger than me. They were Chris and Anthony. We're more like cousins than anything. When we were young kids, possibly around 12 or younger, we would travel into town, and we would see some of the residents who lived there come out of the house. The guy that lived there would always stare down the train tracks by the Lawson house, which is a bar three minutes of a walk away from the old age home. Apparently, he lost a loved one in a train accident. We would always see him staring at the train tracks all day. It was honestly pretty sad to witness. I remember feeling sorry for him. Sometime later in the future, not sure exactly what year, but, but it was the early 2000s, the house's operations stopped and it became abandoned. Over time, kids would break in there to trash the place and to party. My nephews and I would also go into the house to be out of sight, you know, to go smoke, but never to party. Nothing strange ever happened at the time. We never got the sense that it was haunted, but we would later found out that it is. Now, the house has two floors, including a basement and an attic, so I guess if you want to get technical, that would make it four floors. The house was huge, probably about seven to ten bedrooms. I never did count specifically, but there were a lot of rooms. The house was freaky because of how huge it was and the state that it was in. The basement was very dark because there was no electricity to turn on the lights, and it was very dirty with dust and dirt all over. It still had the washers and dryers down there, if you made your way up the stairs to the first and second floors, it looked like it was still in operation. I mean, it was somewhat cluttered, but still looked like people lived there. It's hard to explain. Imagine all the furniture in the living room still there, all the rooms as they were, china cabinets in the hallways, plates, silverware in the industrial-sized kitchen, piano, clothes, clocks on the wall, beds, bedsheets, pillows, family pictures even. Honestly, it just looked like Something happened, and the staff and residents had to leave in a hurry and never come back. Our friend, who I'll call A.G., had family that worked in the old age home while it was still in operation. A.G. told my nephews and I that there were rumors of neglect and abuse that happened there. Whether that's true or not, I cannot say. I found no evidence of neglect and abuse happening in that place, so for the record, I would just call it hearsay. But the fact that we would later conclude the place was haunted, 
and the place looked like it was quickly abandoned for some reason, makes me wonder if some sort of negative emotions were attached to the place. Who knows? Either way, the place looks like it got shut down abruptly. Now I will get into the paranormal stories, and I'll be providing links to the videos that I took. So, A.G., Anthony, and I formed a ghost hunting group we called Haldemand Ghost Hunters, since we lived in the district of Haldemand County. We all had fun venturing into the darkness of the night, trying to capture paranormal activity at haunted locations. We would perform investigations quite frequently, and often we would capture nothing. To be honest with you, ghost hunting is a pretty boring hobby. It's not like what people think. Most of the time, nothing happens, and one has to be pretty dedicated because reviewing the footage and audio can take many days. It takes a lot of work, and imagine going through footage for days just to find nothing. So it can become quite discouraging. That all changed when we decided to investigate this abandoned mansion on King Street in Hackersville. Since A.G. heard about the neglect and abuse, and since the house was very close to us, we decided to investigate the place. We never knew it was haunted before. We never heard it was haunted. And like I said earlier, we never felt it was either. But we were going to go there anyway. To our surprise, we ended up capturing tons of activity. Some things in live moments, other things that went unnoticed until we saw them when we played back the videos on the computer. Anyway, that night, we went off, walking towards this abandoned mansion. I remember the moon was full. It lit up the night sky so well. The town was quiet. It's a small town in the middle of nowhere, really, and no one was out that late. It was around midnight. We walked towards Giant Tiger and then turned right into the driveway. The abandoned mansion and Giant Tiger both share the same driveway. Giant Tiger's walls on the right of the driveway make it look like a back alley as you walk up to this mansion. The house's exterior is brick walls and big windows with curtains in them, and the occasional yellow, no trespassing, and private property signs. The house definitely looked more ominous at night. Honestly, quite freaky. If you were looking at the front of the house, the entrance to the basement is on the right. It's an open door that leads to the stairs, going deep down into the basement. That's where we went, and as the basement's darkness swallowed us up, A.G. and Anthony both said, Good lord, it's really dark in here. I know, I can see that, I replied with a nervous chuckle. It was literally pitch black down there. We couldn't see a thing unless we used flashlights. If the flashlights turned off... The only thing we could see was the IR camera screen, and we only had one camera. The vibe felt completely different than during the day because of how late it was and how we couldn't see anything. We started to explore the entire basement in the dark. We found the washer and dryer we'd seen before, but this time it had a bunch of papers on it. Anthony and AG began to look through these papers, which turned out to be the nurse journals of the patients. It was pretty cool being able to read them and go back in time. I was recording Anthony and A.G. with the camera as they read these papers. I was standing on the stairs when all of a sudden I see this orb fly past their heads. It did a little backflip on the camera screen. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. It could have been a dust particle or a bug. I can 100% confirm there were no bugs in that basement. With it being extremely cold in the fall and the house had no heating, there wasn't a bug in sight. As for the dust particles, I've captured those many times before, and the way it stood out on the camera screen did not give me the impression of dust. To top it off, what really confirmed for me that it wasn't a dust particle was the fact that upon playback, we captured a voice too. A voice that sounded like it said, That's my papers. That ain't the scary part. At this point, we'd never heard the EVP, and I'm the only one who saw the orb. Nothing else paranormal was going on, so we decided to try to establish communication with anyone or anything that might still be there. 
A.G. placed the camera down on a ledge, flipped the camera screen towards him, and stared at the camera. Anthony can be seen in the footage. A.G. tells me to start trying to talk to whatever or whoever might be in the basement. I began to speak aloud, asking questions. The first one was, do you work here? Then I asked, do you sleep here? A.G. began to yell then. I just saw one. Then I asked, Can you tell us your name, please? A.G. screamed again. Another one just flew over Anthony. So by that point, both A.G. and I had seen orbs. Later on the footage, I could see clearly a sort of wisp goes over Anthony's shoulder. It's kind of like a misty spherical light. We were just about to head upstairs. I was filming Anthony just staring into the dark when he suddenly said, Man, I feel weird down here. I replied, What do you mean you feel weird? He says back to me, Oh, you don't even know. As Anthony steps out of frame, I notice a tiny light entity that was by the back of his neck and stayed stationary as Anthony moved away from it before it darted down to the floor. We continued our investigation, moving on up the stairs to the first floor. There was a piano, washrooms, a commercial-sized kitchen, and a living room with a couch. We went to the living room first, sitting down on this couch. This one we didn't see until playback, but as we sat down on the couch, we captured this twirling, smoky light entity, and as it passed by the camera, we also captured an EVP that sounded like it said, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. We explored the rest of the house, second floor, and attic, but we didn't capture anything else. We chilled in the house for a long time, soon deciding it was time to leave. The scary part about the exit was we had to go back into the basement to find those stairs that lead outside, because we couldn't go out the front door. After all, we were trespassing. As we went to the basement, our camera now dead, and our flashlights dim due to the batteries dying, we walked through the darkness together quietly. We found the stairs and made our way towards them, when all of a sudden, we heard a thump somewhere in the basement. This made us book it out of there. Later that night, reviewing all this footage, really seeing and hearing all this phenomena we captured, I wanted to go back that night, but nobody was willing to go. I convinced them to let us just sneak in, leave the camera rolling for a couple of hours, then go back and get it in the morning. They all obliged. We made our way back. We heard weird noises, it seemed more active at the time. There was some type of weird banging sounds, almost like metal. We made our way through the basement, up the stairs, to the first floor. I suggested we leave it in the living room, where we captured that weird smoky twirling mist light. We left the camera there all night. The next day, we came back for the camera and reviewed the footage. On the footage, we heard all types of strange noises in that empty house. It recorded for a couple of hours before dying. We heard banging again on what sounded like metal pipes. We could even hear pull balls hitting each other, even though there were no pull tables in the house. At one point, I swear we heard a nurse talking over the PA system when there was no electricity in the house, let alone any people in there. We couldn't make out what she said. It sounded muffled, but there was indeed someone talking, and it sounded like it was coming from speakers. This is what we call residual energy, like a replay of the past. I've read and heard lots about it, but that was my first time ever experiencing it, or capturing residual energy on audio and camera. I was super intrigued, but to top it off, we also captured something extremely amazing. It was this gigantic, smoky, twirling light entity, twirling and sparkling in the frame. Later, it compressed itself to the floor, then expanded into something about eight feet tall. As it moved from left to right, out of the camera frame, you could see it flying towards the floor. As it twirled towards the floor, all you could hear was a bang. I couldn't believe my eyes and ears. What the heck? did we capture? Was I witnessing free-floating electricity moving through the atmosphere, somehow physically banging on the floor? Some researchers believe we live in a 
torsion field type of universe. The flow of electromagnetic and gravity energies through the Earth keeps it spinning. Picture a whirlpool in the bathtub. That whirlpool is a torsion field. Now look at the entire solar system, with planets revolving around the sun as part of a gigantic torsion field. Even the galaxies are spinning in torsion fields, consisting of trillions and trillions of planets and stars. And now look at what I captured. Did I capture a spirit manifesting as an energetic light entity, appearing and moving around as a torsion field? Don't forget, I captured it twice in the living room, but this time it stayed in frame for quite a while, and I got to study its appearance more in depth. I must have watched that video a thousand times in my life by now. One night it was raining. We tried something we'd never tried before. We went ghost hunting in the rain late at night. We had no idea how badly rotten the abandoned house was. Rain was getting into some parts of the house, and all you could hear was the water falling, hitting wood. So it wasn't ideal for gathering evidence, because of all the noise contamination. Regardless, since we were already in the house, we figured we might as well continue the investigation. We did the usual, making our way through the basement and walking through all the floors. We never captured any physical evidence, but we did capture and hear some strange sounds. Since we had all these crazy experiences in the house before, and what we captured on footage, we decided to straight up call out to the spirits. So Anthony says to the wind, we know you're here. We've caught you a number of times. I added, Yeah, coming down this hallway. That was, after all, where we caught the twirling light entity. Anthony goes on to say, You know where we're standing and you know we're here. All we want to do is talk. Just give us a sign like banging or voices. Do something. A couple of seconds later, I yell out, We know you're here. No need to hide from us. While I was doing the investigation, I was using a parabolic microphone, listening to everything with the headphones on. I could hear things louder than Anthony and AG. After I yelled, don't hide from us, beneath the raindrops, I began to hear knocking or banging somewhere in the house. I told the boys, I heard a knock down there. Then I yelled out, was that you? Addressing the banging. Anthony then tells us he felt weird when he was talking to the wind, and A.G. said, I heard this do, 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 do. So afterward, I decided to knock on the closet wall with that pattern. We stayed quiet for a few seconds, and all we heard was raindrops falling and hitting the outside and inside of the house. But then, we start to hear something being dragged. It was super creepy. What the heck were we hearing? Was it residual energy replaying the past of someone dragging a body across the floor? We left the house not long after that. We didn't come back for a long time. The following is our final story. Unfortunately, we didn't capture any of it on camera. It was our final time to be at that house. One year later, the town had boarded up the basement entrance, making it virtually impossible to get in without breaking in. We did some searching on the premises that night, hoping to get anything we could. We found this small window with some wood covering it. We took off the wood, discovering that if we squeezed through the tiny window, we could get in. At the time, I was a pretty scrawny dude, so it wasn't hard for me to squeeze inside. I went first. The window was about six feet off the ground, so I kind of had to hang and drop to the floor. As soon as I disappeared alone into the dark, with the only light coming from outside, I got instant shivers up my spine. I didn't even know which part of the basement I was in. I looked back at the window and I saw AG coming in, which calmed me down because I knew I wouldn't be alone for long. But to totally get rid of my fear in the moment, I saw Anthony making his way in and the poor guy got stuck. At this point, AG and I were laughing. Anthony was a bigger guy than us, so it wasn't surprising. I went up to him and yanked him out, and we both fell to the ground. It hurt a little, but it was one of the funniest moments of my life. We had a good laugh. Make no mistake, it was all about to fade in the upcoming moments. We navigated through the darkness of the basement, 
two flashlights and one IR camera with us. We didn't want to stay in the basement. We wanted to explore the first floor, since that's where we always captured most of our activity. We were looking for the twirling mist light entity. We navigated around the first floor with nothing happening. Soon our camera battery suddenly got real low, so we decided to turn it off to save some juice. We went into the commercial-sized kitchen. We took a break there and chilled for a while. There was this big exhaust fan that led outside above where the deep fryers were. To our surprise, we caught wind of two police officers talking outside. The sound waves of their voices were traveling through the exhaust fans. A female officer said, Hey, that wood's off that window. Someone just went in there. Our hearts dropped because we didn't want the police to come in and charge us with trespassing, possibly even breaking and entering. The male officer responds, Let's go in then. I'm thinking to myself, oh, we're screwed. To our surprise and luck, the female officer replied, Screw that, I'm not going in there. We all kind of chuckled to each other. The male officer then replied, All right, let's just put the wood back on then. Now I'm thinking to myself, oh great, we're locked in here. We heard the officers board up the window and we heard their footsteps dissipate as they walked away. When I finally thought it was safe to do so, I said, that was a close call, huh? They both agreed. How about we continue this ghost hunt until the camera dies, then we can just get out of here. They agreed, then we headed out of the kitchen. We were walking through complete darkness. We made our way to the living room. I was in the lead with the IR camera. The living room is close to the front door, and as I had my camera in hand, walking toward that front door, suddenly the camera died and not a second later, a massive bang came directly from in front of us. It was so loud, it made us jump like scared little rabbits. I even felt the floor shake. At this point, we froze completely still. I personally thought it was the police coming in the front door. In later conversations, Anthony and AG thought the same thing, apparently. As we realized it really wasn't the police, we quickly concluded that this must have been paranormal. We scattered to escape and quickly made our way back into the dark basement. We had to find the room we came through, then we had to push the wood off the window. One by one, we all had to climb and crawl back out, all the while feeling like something was following us, watching us. It was really unnerving. Was the big bang we heard created by free-floating electricity? Was it the same ghost that told us it was stuck in there? that we were reading its papers. I'll never know. I'm willing to go back, but I would be lying if I said I'm not scared of doing so. The Night I Walked Through Hell From Austin W. I grew up in the southern end of Ontario, Canada, a place known for big bustling cities like Ottawa and Toronto. Places where things go bump in the night, and the first thought is that it's a raccoon or a stray dog. In the case of a 10-year-old me, I lived in a bad pocket of the province, a place where crime and other atrocities were committed whether it was day or night. Supernatural occurrences in my town were few and far between, no stories of being chased through the woods by something unseen, or someone's grandmother moving their favorite mug across the counter having passed some few months ago. Overall, a pretty not-so-quiet town with bigger issues than a little spook here and there. It all began on a rather lackluster day. I went to school, did my work, walked home, and immediately plopped down behind my desk to watch some videos that I found creepy. The early compilations of ghost videos and UFO sightings on YouTube, to be specific. This was a regular routine for me. I would watch these things and research what I saw in them, trying to debunk or gather information on these seemingly anomalous things. After about two hours of browsing through YouTube, it was time for dinner. My family and I always ate together. My mother's fresh home-cooked meals were always something to look forward to, and always a good way to end the day. We would talk about typical things families talked about, school, plans, events, and the annoying amount of teasing that my mother loved to torment me with. I could never live anything down with her around, but it was all in good fun. Dinner wrapped up a little later than usual, 
and I went back to my desk. This time I played Minecraft at a blistering 10 frames per second or so. I don't know how I did it back then, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. I finished my gaming session around 9pm. I then changed into my pajamas, brushed my teeth, and crawled into my loft bed above the desk. Unbeknownst to me, this night would be a night I would never forget. As I lay in the darkness pressed so close to my ceiling, I began to doze off into a peaceful sleep. My mind cleared as my consciousness slipped away into the night. Slowly, though, I began to feel as though I was waking up, feeling much warmer now, as though I was overheating. Before I could move, I was face to face with a wall of skulls, blood, and fire. My ears were filled with screams from what sounded like millions of people echoing in my head. I tried looking around, but I could see nothing but skulls and flames. Suddenly, it felt as though an unseen force had pulled me out of the fire and threw me into a new place. I felt myself cooling rapidly as I took in my new surroundings. A dark, cold expanse with stormy skies, no living vegetation, and the smell of musty, dry rot in the air. I gazed across the landscape, seeing nothing but dead grass, rotting trees and bushes, and the gray light covering the darkened land. I turned back to the direction I was tossed from, seeing a lake or a pit of fire, seemingly burning without a source. The winds carried the smell of fire right to me, but the wind was cold, and it sliced into my face like the cut of a dull old razor. I was dumbfounded. I don't know why, but I wasn't scared of this place. I seemed almost accustomed to this wasteland of sorts. I turned back to where I was looking before, choosing to explore with an empty mind. I walked across the barren land, seeing the odd shadow of a person dart out of the corner of my eye, or the odd shriek of something I couldn't see in the distance. The thing I found most odd about the place was how quiet it was. Aside from the howling of the wind in my ears, the place was mostly silent. After walking for a few hours, I noticed that the light level in the place never changed. It almost seemed like it was midday. The constant glow behind the clouds never once moved or changed like I was standing under a spotlight wherever I went. I realized quickly after walking for a while that I wasn't experiencing any fatigue. I didn't feel hungry or thirsty. I felt as if I'd just eaten an hour ago and was just settled after a full meal. I thought about it all for a moment, remembering that I'd gone to bed at 9pm and I'd eaten 6pm before that, and if I'd been walking for a few hours, any normal person would be looking for a snack or a bottle of water. I reasoned that maybe I wasn't hungry because I just didn't feel like eating. Very dumb reasoning, I know. I was never the smartest kid. I was known more as a stubborn type. I continued my walk for hours, seeing and hearing the same things. I wandered this wasteland for what seemed like ages. I never saw any other living beings save those distant shadows. I did find some bones here and there, from something long since past. I noticed I never changed either, still in my PJs, my hair, nails, and body never changing. I was still the same as the day I'd appeared in this strange place. I kept walking until I found an old tree in a valley of some kind. I decided to stop for a minute and find out where to go next when I heard a low growl from the inside of the tree. I backed up and stared at it. Was that a dog? I thought. Before I could open my mouth to give it a baby-voiced greeting, a shadow seemingly materialized from the tree and lunged out at me. It had no defining features, no nose, no eyes, no mouth. It knocked me over and held me to the ground. Its raspy voice seemed as though it had three different people speaking from within. You don't belong here too soon. Without another moment, I found myself suddenly lying in my bed in the darkness of my room. I looked to my left and read the time. It had only been five minutes past 9pm, and that couldn't be. It felt as though I'd been gone for years. I felt my body validating that I was alive, and sure enough, I was. I lay back in bed, 
no desire to sleep any longer. Eventually, though, my body made the choice for me and I passed out. I woke up some time later to a voice in my ear, the same voice to which I'd heard before I returned, a whisper, I'm here, boy. Ever since this, I've experienced many strange paranormal phenomena. I've begun to look into astral projection and the nuances of it, but still I never got a straight answer as to what I experienced or why. Every now and again, I swear I hear that voice on the wind, and I see things I'm sure I shouldn't. To this day, I wonder, was it a dream or did my soul leave my body and venture off somewhere disturbing where it shouldn't be? Sometimes it feels like I brought something back. Not My Mother From Stephanie R. I live alone with my daughter Sophie in Ottawa. On this particular night, I was residing in a tiny building. We live on the second floor and my balcony is located to the right of the building's entrance facing upwards. The large bay window in my daughter's room is the window closest to the entrance door, also facing upwards. However, our buzzer did not work. So during winters, our guests would lightly throw a snowball at our window, and we would come and let them in. I know, right? A great system. But that's what you get for cheap rent in the ghetto. On this silent night around 7 p.m., I heard a snowball hit my daughter's window. I climbed up my daughter's bunk bed and moved the curtain to see the small, dark hooded figure of my mother. She is petite and struggles with addiction, but she's still my mom. She pointed to the parking lot entrance, not the front door, which was strange. Like an idiot, I pointed at the front door and rushed to get my young daughter dressed, changed out of her pajamas, put on my boots, and took the elevator down to the front of my building to let her in. However, when I got there, there was no one there. We walked around the parking lot, but it was empty, except for the silent flakes of snow falling on the still night. There was no wind either. Nobody was out there. It was quite eerie as I recall it now. How foolish of me to bring my three-year-old daughter outside, even in my arms. It's shameful. I re-entered the building and put my little one back in bed, so she could finish watching her movie. Then I proceeded to call my mother. Our conversation went like this. Mom, where are you? I went outside and you weren't there. I mean, I didn't take that long to get down there. Are you okay? She replied. You're giving me goosebumps right now. I'm out on Beechwood Avenue. Nowhere near your place, baby. But I just saw you outside. You threw a snowball at the window. You pointed at the parking lot. I pointed at the front door. You just stared at me. She replied, That's the spookiest thing I've ever heard. I don't know what to say. That wasn't me. I apologized for freaking her out. I told her I loved her and hung up the phone, feeling shocked. I locked my door, and as an Ojibwe woman, I lit some sage to cleanse my home, myself, and my now sleeping child. I poured some salt out on my windowsills, yet I still trembled. Even as I write this now, my heart is heavy, and I struggle to breathe. My pulse races. Even after two years, when I allow myself to remember, I still shudder. Not just because I still don't understand what happened, but because I was such a fool to naively venture out with my baby girl. What was I even searching for? It's so strange and so shameful, I'm left to wonder who and why. Thank you, God. The highest spirit has saved me more than once. I'm truly blessed. Besides, during the COVID times, no one ever visited us anyway. My Paranormal Experiences From Anonymous Canadian I have had my own personal experiences as well as experiences recounted by family members. I'll present these in chronological order, and I'll do my best to provide as many details as possible. 
The first knowledge I had of shadow people was when I was between the ages of 7 and 12. This happened in the late 90s to early 2000s. At that time, I had no knowledge of the phenomenon, or even knew what they were called. From what I remember, this incident took place during the summer. My parents were away, and a babysitter from our street came over to watch my brothers and me. She brought her brother over, who was our age. While my brothers and I were playing outside with a few other friends, the babysitter and some of my brothers stayed inside. Suddenly, my brothers ran out into the front yard and told us that there was a pitch black shadow figure standing at the top of our stairs in the house. The babysitter came out shortly after, and they explained what happened. She went to check it out, but she didn't see anything. I don't recall much else happening after that. During a similar time frame, maybe within a year or two of that incident, my youngest brother, who was about two or three years old at the time, came downstairs from his room into the kitchen where my mom and I were. He asked us who the man in his room was. My mom and I were quite confused, so I asked if he meant the poster of Superman he had. He responded, telling me, No, the black man. My mom and I went upstairs to check it out, but found nothing. The next experience actually happened to me. I do believe this took place after the previous experience. I was upstairs using the master bathroom, which was directly connected to the master bedroom and the upstairs hallway, shared by everyone. My two youngest brothers shared the master bedroom because my parents thought they needed the extra space for their toys and to play. From where the toilet is located, if the door is left open, you can look directly out into the master bedroom. While I was sitting on the toilet, I'd left the door open. About halfway through, I looked to my left, and I saw a very dark black hand reaching around the open door frame. I could only see the hand and part of the wrist. I don't recall much else happening after that point, but it was definitely freaky. The next experience happened to two of my brothers in the master bedroom. They told me about it in the morning after it occurred. They claimed, while they were sleeping, they both woke up around the same time. They looked over to the end of their bedroom and spotted a glowing fluorescent greenish slime on the wall, being painted on by seemingly nothing. If I recall correctly, they both claimed that it formed a skull shape on the wall. When I went to check it out for myself, nothing was there. After that, nothing really happened for a while. I believe this next incident happened after 2016. I woke up one morning, and my second oldest brother, I am the eldest, was sitting at the side of my bed, completely awake. I asked what he was doing, and he recounted the freakiest story so far. He told me he'd been downstairs the previous night, well past midnight, playing Sudoku on his phone while lying on the couch in our living room. The living room connects to the dining room through French doors. He told me that the app kept crashing on him. When he reopened the app, it was supposed to show the last three moves he had made, with the numbers popping up and spinning before going back to normal. But he said when he reopened the app, three sixes did this. I know it sounds cliche. Despite not believing that these were the last moves he made, he got annoyed and decided to call it a night. However, before going to bed, he decided to grab a snack from the kitchen. Keep in mind that the whole main floor was fairly dark at this point. As my brother opened the doors to the dining room, he saw the outline of a silhouette of a woman in a dress sitting on top of our dining room table. He was able to see the outline of her due to the sliding glass doors behind her. He told me he could not see any details and just stared, terrified, for about 30 seconds before turning around and booking it out of there, going all the way up to my room. He claims he was awake all night and didn't end up sleeping until everyone else was awake. He only slept for a few hours. I've only brought it up a few times since then, and he doesn't really know what to make of it. I think he's just hoping it was his eyes playing tricks on him. This next experience is more weird than anything. I'm not sure if it's paranormal, but I suppose it could be. 
This took place around the summer of 2018. I was headed to bed. I turned off the lights and lay down. In my room, my closet is at the end of my bed, and I noticed that the light was coming out from the cracks within my closet. This was really weird, because my closet is fairly small, and there's no light inside. I got up, turned on the lights in my room, and opened the closet door. Inside my closet, I have these flat, clear Tupperware-style storage bins that contain toys and random things from when I was a kid, which I no longer use. In one of these boxes, there was a book lamp clip that was somehow turned on. The weird thing is that it isn't a pressure button that turns it on, it's a sliding switch. It had probably been in storage for over 10 years, so even if I somehow never noticed the light before this, there's no way a battery could have lasted that long. I'm really not sure what to make of this, or how on earth it could have possibly been turned on at all. It was very weird. In January of 2019, I moved out of my parents' home and got my own place. In April, I had a week-long business trip in Calgary, Alberta, about a three-hour flight from where I live. When I got back, despite only a two-hour time change, I was absolutely exhausted. I'd barely slept on the plane, and I was somewhat jet-lagged when I got home. This trip was the first time I'd ever been on a plane. As soon as I got home, I crashed in my bed without even bothering to change out of my clothes. I was falling in and out of consciousness, and was kind of half awakeish. For perspective, if you're lying in my bed, to the left, there is about a four-foot gap to the wall, and on the right, the same, but that side has a window. While lying on my bed, I was on my left side, lying on the side facing the wall. I woke up and kind of adjusted my position, but as I did so, I noticed that my headboard looked kind of different, which struck me as odd. It's a storage headboard from Ikea, and the storage is on the sides. However, I noticed that it now was on the front of my headboard. I got out of bed and looked at it, walking around to the other side of my bed to get a better look. At this point, my room was sort of dark, but not to the point that I couldn't see. After looking on the other side of my bed, I decided to go turn on the lights to get a better look. However, as I was walking to the lights, when I got to the end of my bed, I froze, as if I was suddenly paralyzed. Because of this, I fell face first into my mattress and was immediately sucked back into my body, and I for real woke up. Kind of like when you dream that you trip and you fall back into reality waking up. The weird thing was, besides my weird looking headboard, there was no indication that I was even asleep. I don't know if this was some sort of astral projection or a dream. This is where things get weird. When I woke up for real, I began to hear footsteps walking outside of my room. I realized then that I couldn't move. I assumed this was some sort of sleep paralysis. I then began to hear someone speaking at the end of my bed, but I couldn't turn to look. I don't know if I'd even want to, based on what I've heard some people see during sleep paralysis. I then heard another voice respond to the first. This voice came from behind me. Both voices were male, but I can't recall what they were saying because I was scared. At this point, since I was so close to the edge of my bed, I was desperately trying to roll off to get out of my sleep paralysis. I finally managed to, but as I did, it seemed like time slowed down. I was halfway to hitting the floor when I got sucked back into my body again and I was back to where I started. This happened two more times in a row with the same results. Finally, after the third try, I heard the voice behind me say clearly, you should thank me. Then I was finally able to move and be awake again. I immediately got up, looked around beyond freaked out, checking out the rest of the room to make sure everything was good and that the people that were speaking were gone. This was the first time I'd ever had auditory hallucinations from sleep paralysis, if they were hallucinations. Before that, I'd only ever experienced something like this two or three times. It was never scary before, but prior experiences, I never heard or saw anything. I just couldn't move. 
The thing that really weirded me out was the whole getting sucked back into my body thing. It was one of the freakiest sensations ever, which is why I wasn't sure if it was maybe some kind of astral projection. Coupled with nightmares and sleep paralysis, I really have no idea. I'm assuming my lack of sleep and being jet-lagged were contributing factors, but I can't be sure. Have you had a similar experience? Have you ever astral projected? Red Deer Clan from Anonymous This happened to me one summer break around 2006 or 2007. I spent the summer that year working at my first job. This wasn't by choice. My parents made me. I lived in Alberta, Canada, in a small city called Red Deer. Normally, we'd go visit my family in Saskatchewan for the summer. But this year, we were staying put. Needless to say, I was expecting a boring summer. Now, you should know, back in the Great Depression, Alberta was a hotspot of racism and clan activity. And I mean the clan spelled with three Ks. For those not familiar with Canada, it may seem weird that we had the clan even up here, but we did. But Alberta is a very white province, so most of the clan's hatred and bigotry was aimed at Roman Catholics. My family was Roman Catholic, which makes this story a bit scarier for me. Anyway, since it was summer, I often rode my bike to and from work because it was peaceful, and I liked the alone time it gave me. I worked in the city's most popular mall, Bower Place. I'd always been a nerd, so I worked in an electronics store selling video games. As a teenager, I tended to work nights. Even though my availability said I could work days, I wasn't a daytime employee, so rarely did I get daytime shifts. That meant that I often worked at 4 or 5 p.m., getting off between 9.30 and 10 p.m. At the time, it didn't bother me. I lived in a newer part of the city, near my high school. It was probably a 15 to 20 minute drive from my work, but it only took about half an hour to get home by bike, because Red Deer is full of parks and bike paths. Thinking back on it as an adult, my route to and from work probably wasn't the safest. Whenever I'd leave for work, I'd go out of the back alley and cut through other alleys, until I got to the only major road along the way. Then I'd ride across the road and down a side street until I got to the entrance of the bike paths. These bike paths were literally in a forest in the middle of the city, and the trip through them would take about 15 minutes. The path came out of the trees right across the street from the mall. Then I would bike across the road and across the parking lot until I got to the entrance nearest to the store. I'm telling you this because I didn't spend much of my ride in a populated area at all. I should add that that forest has a reputation of being the home to numerous homeless people. I've come across many makeshift campsites in my youth. It was also a popular place for people to party and get drunk. On that day, I was following my usual routine. I had just gotten off work, and it was a beautiful night out. I must have gotten off late because I remember it was already getting dark. I also didn't have my iPod for some reason, as I usually like to listen to music when I biked. I probably just forgot to charge it. But thankfully, for whatever reason, I didn't have it. Otherwise, I never would have heard what I heard. I remember hopping on my bike and saying goodbye to some of my coworkers as they walked past. Then I took off through the parking lot. I got to the entrance of the trees and slowed down so that my eyes could adjust. The path went down a bit of a steep incline and immediately curved. So if I didn't let my eyes adjust, there's a chance I would have just gone off the path and hit a tree. By the time I made it past the curve, I could see fine. So I picked up the speed. Farther down the trail, it split. If I went straight, I'd eventually get to a large park on the outskirts of the downtown area, but I always went along the other path which curved to the right and took me over a bridge. It was right before I got to that split when I began to hear people. At first, I thought it was a large group of drunk people heading to one of the clubs, but their voices sounded different than that. It was like they were chanting something all at once, and they certainly didn't sound drunk. 
Their volume wasn't going up and down like drunk people's do when they're trying to be quiet. By then, I thought maybe a group of folks had set up a party in the trees. But that seemed odd too, since the path was so close to a creek in that area, and there was a residential area nearby. People usually went deeper into the woods to party. I should have just kept riding and ignored the voices, but I was curious and dumb. So I climbed off my bike, hit it off the path, and I walked into the trees to check it out. While I've already admitted I was a nerd, I wasn't completely helpless. I joined the Sea Cadets at the age of 12 and had recently begun taking mixed martial arts courses. Before that, I'd been in Hapkido. Needless to say, I thought I could sneak up on the group without being heard and get away if need be. So I went creeping through the trees, flinching every time a twig snapped, getting ever closer to these voices. I soon saw smoke, and then the fire itself, before I saw the people. This fire was huge. It was like something you'd see in a movie, where the college students have a bonfire on the beach. I wondered at first if maybe they weren't watching it closely, and that they'd started a forest fire but I think what I saw was actually far worse. The trees in the forest are young, so there aren't many places to hide. That said, I tried to stay back behind a bush to avoid being seen. I wasn't able to get a good look at the people as a result, but I did eventually get a look at what was making the fire so big. There was a cross hoisted up in the middle of it. They were burning a cross. I thought that kind of thing only ever happened in movies, I'm not really very religious myself, but it sent a chill up my spine. I froze at the sight of it. At the time, I knew nothing about the history of the clan and Red Deer, so I didn't know what to make of it. Then I began to see flashes of white as people moved back and forth across the spaces in the trees nearest me. I probably should have just stayed hidden, but I panicked, jumping up, and I began running towards my bike. The people saw me. I heard them screaming and yelling at me. Then I heard their footsteps rapidly crunching through the forest right behind me. I didn't bother looking back. I grabbed my bike and took off down the path. I made it out of the forest that day in record time, riding down the side street and across the busy road until I was in the safety of the nearest alley. At that point, I stopped my bike and turned around. I had no idea if those people followed me out of the forest, but I didn't see anyone. I could see, however, smoke billowing out of the trees. I think someone must have called 911 because I began to hear fire trucks getting closer. I didn't stick around to see. Instead, I rode my bike home, hiding in my bedroom for the rest of the night. I'm not sure if anything ever came of it. I never heard anything about it afterwards. It also didn't stop me from taking that path to and from work, but I never saw or heard anything like it ever again. I'm pretty sure what I saw that day was a clan meeting because I did some research after that incident, and I don't think there's any other possible explanation, especially with all that burning a cross on a bonfire business. Creepy Old Lady From Darkly Dead 12 the year was 1994, a very nice year for me. We lived in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. One day, though, my happiness came to an abrupt stop. I was walking home because my grandma had asked me if I could get her some mint and cucumbers. She was making a salad. I went off to buy those things for her. My grandma had also mentioned not to take too long, seeming a bit worried for whatever reason. I thought, okay... Just a worried grandma, but I had no idea what she might be worried about. I bought the mint and cucumbers and began my walk home. Now, no one in my family had bothered to get a driver's license, and this walk took about 54 minutes. I'd always been told it was better to walk anyway. So as I was walking home, I saw this old woman. She was holding a really heavy basket. I walked up and asked if I could hold her basket to help her out. She said yes, though I must admit her voice sounded very odd. I ignored that. Right away things got weird. As I carried her basket, 
she suddenly asked. Can I move in with you, dearie? Huh? Why? I I'm sorry I don't really know you. Well, my husband died this morning, and our house burnt down days before that. We've been living on the streets. Not really knowing how to reply to this, I just told her she could ask my family, even though obviously they would say no to a stranger living with them. As we walked, I noticed the old lady was doing something with her nails. She was scraping them against each other, like she was sharpening them. I faced ahead and tried to ignore her. Later on, when I glanced at her again, she had disappeared. I dropped the basket and ran home. While running, I looked up into the trees having heard something, and I swear I saw her climbing a tree, and her nails looked somehow bigger than before. She looked at me, I screamed, and ran faster than ever before. I soon made it home locking the door, my grandma just staring at me all so terrified. She said to me, You saw her, didn't you? We stayed inside as snow began to fall outside. Oddly enough, as the snow continued later on in the week, I found blood leading into the cemetery. I wonder if it's connected to that weird old lady. After the incident, I listened to my grandma's warnings, no matter how sudden or out of place they might seem. A year later, we moved to San Francisco, and I haven't had a crazy old woman sighting since. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs, Go to EerieCast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.